jobs. And the only province in the entire country was the Western, which didn't shed jobs, sorry, was the Western Cape, which increased the number of people working by 8,000 people. These okay, are tiny when numbers. When you're talking about but somebody in Johannesburg who's trends. thinking, should I vote for this party? Mm. I mean, one of the things that you will know that has been said about you mm. is they look to you, as you say, a young black woman leading this party. Mm. And they see somebody, I mean, and I've, I've read enough of, of this call for, they want, to, they want a role model. Mm. And it was even one of your own colleagues, he admittedly apologised for it afterwards, who said, if you close your eyes and listen to Lindiwe Mazibuka, when she speaks, you, you would say, a white person is talking to you. And what they're after is a black role model, someone who will talk about the difficulties of, of the economic situation when you are black. One of the big mistakes a lot of people who analyse South African politics in South Africa make is believing that the only people who can attract support from any particular race group or population group are people who look and sound like that group. It's a mistake that the ANC made when it thought that by simply having a coloured leader campaigning in the Western Cape, coloured South African people would automatically rally behind it and support it. When instead, Helen Ziller, a white woman of German extraction, who learned to speak Afrikaans, who learned to speak Iskosa, went out into the community in the Western Cape and managed to empathise with, engage with and understand the issues close to the members of those communities' hearts, enough to win their support. Tony Leon is another case in point. Okay, but what about you? Why, I mean, the, the, what so, the call is in a sense to is me. for you to speak from your heart and they see you come from a comfortably off, middle-class mm -hmm. family, mm -hmm. privately educated, you mm -hmm. spent time overseas, mm -hmm. and you don't, I, I presume you are fluent in... I am. But you choose not to be fluent in, to, to speak in Zulu. Not at all. I speak in Zulu all the time, but I can't speak it at the BBC because this is an English language medium but broadcasting house. But do you recognise that you haven't reached people? That it's the personal thing. It's yeah. a sort of a, a recognition, a feeling that you could be speaking for them rather than you comfortably off woman leading a white party. Yeah. I know you object to the thing, but that is... It's not that I object to it. It's that the people who make that analysis don't engage with me in any other context. The people who say my English is prim and proper only listen to me on English stations. They don't listen to me on Isuzulu speaking broadcasting stations. They don't come to rallies and campaigns in rural areas around the country where I and my colleagues engage with, sing with, talk with, walk with members of the community from all walks of life. In the DA, we don't expect people only to speak to people who look and sound like them. They go, therefore, just because I am black and middle class, I'm not only expected to campaign okay. in middle class tell areas. Us, tell my us how work you see yourself. Do communicate you see, with everyone. Do you see yourself as black first and South African second? Or the other way around? If I were to self-identify, I would call myself a black South African young woman. That's black the order first? in which I identify myself, yes. So black comes first. And in my personal view, yes. And I also acknowledge the right of every South African to choose whatever order they want to order their identity. And it's not, it's not a group think uh, kind of identification system. That's what apartheid was. But if I think about my identity as a South African, as a political leader, the first thing that comes to me is that I am black, yes. And, and for most black South Africans, do you think that would be the case? Well, I don't know. I suspect that it is as a legacy of apartheid because it was a function of whether or not you got access to resources or where you lived or what you did for, you know, it was, it was, it was deemed to be the only important identifier of you as an individual. It's probably why there's a residual uh, self-identification that begins with race in South Africa, which is another thing that we acknowledge as a party, which is that we're not trying to pretend race doesn't exist. Transcending race is isn't about acting as though it has no cogency. What it is about is making people understand that they can trust one another across racial barriers and across racial lines and across class lines and language lines. But do you pick up a willingness, a, a desire from people to, to want you perhaps to speak more about race, not in a necessarily in a divisive way, yes. but just to be more aware of it, Absolutely. not to try to be in denial or yes. as some people would suggest, mm. or to try to transcend it as you often do yes. because it sounds like you're perhaps trying to speak to your the your white supporters or pacify no, them or a, not at all not, not at all freak them out because the, the it's not about not freaking people out africana nationalism under the national party or black nationalism under a black nationalist party are equally bad for south africa 
Nationalism isn't something that's limited to any one race group. The problem with nationalism of any kind is that it excludes people and it identifies them only on the basis of their race and not on the basis of anything they have to offer. Okay. And if we're trying to bind the wounds of apartheid, we can't offer a political offer at a national level that is based entirely on race. We have to be able to say to people, we understand the cogency of race. We know that inequality has a color and we know that we have to address these disparities. But in order to do so, we have to do it together and not separated by right. our groups as apartheid dictators. Okay, we'll talk about doing it together. Mm. The, uh, th there have been attempts uh, for your party to try to get uh, Dr. Manfela Ramfeli on board. Now, she was the mm. partner of Steve Biko, mm -hmm. who was the father of South Africa's Black Consciousness Movement, mm. a really significant figure. Absolutely. And it failed. And in yes. fact, she ended up setting up her own uh, political platform, a mm. party. And there are other, and, and this, there has been this problem with the divided opposition. Yes. And you are never going to be able to take on the ANC unless you work together, are you? We know this for a fact, absolutely. When we talk about our electoral goals entering government in 2019, we talk about it in coalition. We believe that the first time we have a new government in South Africa, it'll be when the ANC is pushed below 50% and the, the opposition is able to work together. We were engaged in protracted negotiations with Dr. Rampelli. It's now a matter of public knowledge. Um, a woman all of us in the Democratic Alliance admire her track record, her A woman values. You offered, to, you offered her to be your leader, to change the name of the party. And, and she declined because she decided to choose a different path. Her path was to form a different political organization and contest the elections on her own. She's